This is Matt Cohen for Matt Cohen Photo Workshops. For more information, you can go to mattcohenphoto.com slash workshops. Today, we're going to be looking at pictures by Elizabeth Hay. These were taken at the Gilroy workshop in August of 2019. It's going to be a little bit different because Elizabeth is not a rodeo photographer. She's not trying to become a rodeo photographer. Um, she is more of a, I guess I would say fashion lifestyle. Uh, she shoots people a lot, but mostly standing around, not moving. So this was kind of a challenge for her because when she shoots for her work, she gets to position people and decide what they wear and where they're going to be relative to the light. And in this shoot, she just had to go with what was there. So. It was definitely more of a challenge for her than it was uh, for everybody else who's used to being around rodeos and being very close to animals. Um, <laughs> I saw her diving for cover a few times, even though we were behind a fence. Um, not to call her out, I've you know I've been there myself. I've seen other people do it, and often the best pictures from any given rodeo will be whoever, not a rodeo photographer. So it's not. Um, it's not out of the question for somebody to go to a rodeo who doesn't shoot rodeo and still come out with really good pictures, which Elizabeth does have some of those. So let's get into it. Um, grand entry. So the problem with this is that you had uh, a lot of the arena to work with here, but by the time she got to where you were, you have this... Uh, telephone lighting pole and then the lights here so and and that took the focus away from the subject so this is a throwaway right off the bat but i would say that even if it was in focus you still have kind of uh compositional problems where it's not level you know this isn't this isn't a straight line here you're kind of rolling downhill and then um you know there's nothing you're not close enough for it to be a really impactful picture and it's not far enough to be like a, a wide angle landscape or something like that. The light isn't really helping you very much here either. So I don't know this one. What you would want is them coming a lot closer to you and then you would have something to work with, which is what what happened here. So I like the idea here of you have the sign of the rodeo in the background and then you were right along the edge where they were coming around. You can see how much closer these people were than this like this is probably um i don't know 20 feet away 15 20 feet away something like that and then this is like four feet away or something so pretty big difference um the problem with this obviously is this guy standing here so it's tough things move fast at a rodeo and as you can see elizabeth was pretty low here um, what I do is I look around, I try to figure out where might somebody get in my way. So it could be a bullfighter. It could be a pickup man, could be a judge, could be, I don't know, one of the gate men. It could be anything, right? So I want to know where might that person come and what would I do if they came there? So not being experienced in rodeo, it's not, you know, it's, you don't know any better. You just, you just keep shooting. So that's fine. But Next time, what you do when you see a guy who's starting to creep into your frame or, you know, might be trying to get from one place to the other place, um, you know, you can, you have a couple choices. You can keep shooting and maybe this is what you end up with. You keep shooting, maybe he doesn't come into the frame. Maybe he does and it looks cool. You never know. But for me, I want the cleanest shot without having to worry about somebody stepping into me. So I'm going to be ready if I see something like this to take a step back from the fence and go right to where he is, like just on his left so that he's not in the way anymore. So you need to be able to react very quickly when something comes in that's going to ruin your shot. So did he ruin it? Not really, because if you wanted this to just be a picture of the horse and the rider and the flag in the front, you could just crop that. Um, you don't need to have it be this wide to bring him into it. So that's what I would say. Um, you know, there's, let's, let's see what a crop looks like here. So 
So you could do something like this. I would say this, this mostly takes care of that. This is better. Um, you know, it, it was better when it was wider, right? So you want this kind of, you want the more of the wide perspective, but I would say that the, any kind of gain you have in the wider perspective is canceled out by him being there. So this is probably the crop that you want to go with here. But if I'm taking grand entry pictures, I really want to do something that's dramatic. So you're low here, you're definitely not standing up, but when I was shooting things like this, I was, I had my camera literally in the dirt and, you know, couldn't get any lower. So these kind of pictures that people see a lot, that people make a lot because you don't, you know, you don't need to have a, a media credential to get grand entry pictures. Anybody could really do it. Um, you're, you're going to try to take advantage of the ability to be this close and be this low. And for me, that means either climbing up on the fence and maybe shooting down onto them or shooting in the dirt and shooting straight up with the sky as the background. But this is not enough. You're not, you know, you're not really putting your mark on this picture to the extent that I've seen you that you're able to do. So think about a more extreme angle and think about the composition and then also, um, still having to keep in mind that other people can walk in the frame and screw you up there. But I like this crop better. The, I can see what you were trying to do here. It's like a cute picture of people playing, um, as the kids rodeo is going on, but it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me because you can't really see this kid. So I, I would rather it was just the kid standing up or it, you know, if you could see maybe part of her face, through the legs, that would be one thing, or if the other kid had been sticking his or her head out through here, that would be okay. But just having the two legs kind of covering up the back of somebody else, um, I don't know. It, there's not really, it doesn't really hit me the way it would if there was, I don't know, at least a face or something that was more recognizable about this person, or if that person wasn't there and it was just about the legs and the boots and then the fact that the kids rodeo was going on in the background. So I like the idea. I like the fact that you got in there, um, you know, pretty close to what was going on as close as you could possibly be to it. In this case, that's good. I like that you got the kind of, um, the details, you can see the details in the boots. Like this is important. This is something that gets lost when people aren't careful. If they maybe don't use enough depth of field or if they don't nail the focus exactly, you lose this and this picture is made better by the fact that you can see all these, like the buck stitching and the grain of the leather and the mud on the sole of the boot, like all oh, that's pretty cool. I just, I don't know. I would have hung around here a little bit more, maybe seen if this kid would have stayed around and this kid would have turned around or done something else or seen if I could get a different angle on them because this just isn't, it's just not satisfying the way they're kind of covering up and the way that the, sun is hitting here but it's not hitting here it's just not all that aesthetically pleasing to me this is cool i i think it's like maybe you got a little bit carried away with the the subject right the buckle and the kid and you didn't really work the angle as much as you could have like this kind of just looks secondary and like you didn't really pay attention to it if i'm looking at uh i don't know if I'm looking, if all of this is one color or something, that's fine, but it's kind of distracting that there's, you know, either mud or, or poop or whatever, just laying around here. That's kind of distracting and not very visually pleasing. And then you have these people standing around, like these people aren't adding to it. If there was nothing here at all, that might add a little bit more to it. Or if there were a whole lineup of people, or if there were people kind of behind him, but close to the camera and circling around him. And then this was in focus and this was out of focus or you know a little bit out of focus and then the people behind him were more out of focus that would be one thing but i don't know like this part of the picture is good but it looks unfinished it looks like um i don't know the the only thought that you gave to this was oh well the sky will be in the background and it's kind of close to the rule of thirds that's that's what it looks like so the idea is cool um you know, using depth of field, having the buckle be in focus because it was at this rodeo and then having, um, you know, having his little fingers there, that's kind of cool too. And then having his eyes just over this, like all of that is good. It's just not a finished picture. Like you could, I guess, 
you could say something like, um, I don't know, let's, let's look at this. Yeah, I mean, it's still, it's still kind of like a one dimensional picture. I think that when you do something like this, especially, you know, think about when you're shooting for your, for your actual work, when you, um, when you're staging someone, you're not just paying attention to the dress that they're wearing or their makeup or their face or something. It all has to work together where the light is, what is comprising the background, what's comprising the foreground. So you, when you do this in a live setting where you, you know, you can definitely get this kid to hold out his buckle, but only for a minute, not like when you have a model and the model's there for as long as you say, right? So you really need to get ready to um, get what you want as quickly as possible, communicate to the people that you can communicate with, and then still make pictures if you can't, you know, they'll just be like a competitor or something like that. You're not going to be able to say, oh, I know, I know you need to go warm up your horse right now, but can you ride around here a little bit? You just can't do that. So you really have to be prepared to get things on the fly and have the picture that you want in your head so that you can get to it faster and not actually never make it there. Like in this case, like leaving all of this around here that doesn't add to the picture. That's the kind of thing where you have to have it in your head. Like, okay, I'm going to shoot this shallow depth of field thing with the buckle in the face. What can I use as the background? Well, you could use a fence or you could use the pens with the animals in it or the parking lot or the mountains or the trees or something like that. But what you probably don't want to use is, you know, a dirty, you know, just like a dirty area here and then people standing around casually behind. So, um, you know, this is the kind of thing where, like I said, you have a lot of time to do this when you're shooting models. You have very little time to do this when you're not. Yeah, this one, I just, you know, this one's a better, I would rather look at this picture than this one. Um, you know, this one is more carefully composed. You can definitely see there's a horizon going on here and it, having the arena dirt is better than the parking lot dirt. But again, there's still not very much going on here too much for it to be a clean picture and not enough for it to be just uh, a crowd of people or something like that. So again, it just looks kind of incomplete. Like you, you got him to pose for you and it's cute that he still has his stick horse and he has the the buckle in the box still, but um, it's not, there's still this, none of this is, like I guess the sky is probably adding to the picture, but everything that's going on below the sky is not adding to the picture. So again, what would you do? Um, you know, maybe turn around and shoot into the sun so that the whole background gets blown out and then you don't have to worry about what's going on back there or walking up and shooting him down. I know people say, oh, you always want to shoot kids from below. Yeah, that's fine. Just like you always want to use the, the rule of thirds, right? Until you don't want to, or until you figure out a, a way that looks better. And so maybe walking up to this kid and shooting down on him or just the arena dirt was in the background would have been better. Maybe the shadow becomes more of the picture and you're much closer to him, but also have a cleaner background. So that's maybe something to think about in that situation. This one, uh, no, I, I don't like um, cutting off. Uh, I'm, I'm a real stickler for cutting off limbs awkwardly like this. And I don't, I don't really know what the purpose of it was because you could have been um, lower than this or you could have, I don't know, brought the, the camera down a little bit so that the top of the frame was here. That easily would have given you her feet. I don't know what this is, whether it's somebody's hat who might have been standing next to you or something, but you know, you could have definitely com composed around that. I'm guessing that you just didn't see it while you were shooting it, which brings me to where you just locked on to her face. And that's easy to do, right? You shoot people, you're looking at people's eyes and their faces and making sure that their hair is out of their eyes or whatever. Um, and it's easy to get locked into that and just say, okay, this is where the picture is. Oh yeah, she's looking, I'm going to take this picture. Okay, but what I would say is, what are you, what are you doing all around here? And again, you'll probably hear me say this like every second or third critique. But I learned from a guy who was in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he said that you have to start at the edges and then work your way in. And what he's saying is, yeah, you're not just going around randomly looking at edges. You kind of know what you're going to shoot. You know you're going to shoot this girl, but as you're going to make the picture 
you know, when you identify the subject, then you look, okay, are the edges screwing me? Is there somebody in the picture that I don't want in the picture? And that's this one, right? So were you, everything was moving a lot faster in this case, but you definitely weren't looking at the edges of the frame when this was happening. You were only looking at the woman on the horse. And so the edge got you here. And yes, you were able to crop around it, but it would be better if he wasn't there in the first place. And so we go here and you say, okay, well, what about the edges? Well, I don't, you know, first of all, this is on two edges, right? So I, I don't, I still don't know what this is, but I'm guessing it's somebody else's hat or arm or something like that. And then, so you have her ankles getting cut off over here. So three of the edges have something in them that you don't want to have in them. So that's my guess. That's, you know, reverse engineering how this picture was made. My guess is you were completely locked into this cute cowgirl, you know, with a ponytail and, um, you know, where's my mommy look on her face and that's fine, but that doesn't make the picture. That just, that's just a part of a picture. So you have to get all this other stuff, right? So this would be another situation where maybe you walk over here and you're shooting her straight on and using the whole arena and the mountains in the background, or maybe you're again, shooting down on her and you're getting like her face and then the bars and the dirt in the background, a lot of different chances when you're up this close and you can move around a little bit. One of the things that I was emphasizing was if you're shooting with a wide angle, in this case, uh, 18 millimeters, even tiny little adjustments, a few inches one way, tilting your camera forward or back can make a big difference in the composition. And you should be, uh, you know, really used to these lenses enough and know when you bring your camera up to your face, what am I going to see? Where are the edges of this going to be? Am I including everything in the picture that's going to help? And am I excluding everything that's not going to help? And in this situation, I think we're cutting some things off here and we're adding some things here. And if you had, you know, just moved down a little bit, you could have done the same picture, but got her feet in and not had this in. And then you could have had all kinds of different uh, compositions if you had been here shooting down here shooting up or, you know, any combination of that. So when you get in close like this, I, I just say, look through the viewfinder and move around. You'll start to hear that voice that says, I'm getting closer. This starts to look better. No, I've moved too far. And now there's something that doesn't look right. A, a car's windshield is throwing a reflection or a, you know, a hotspot or something like that. So the more you move around, the more you'll be able to feel the, you know, the, the edges of the picture coming together. This is less distracting. This, you know, this sets off my subject. This eliminates something that uh, I didn't want people to have to look at or something, I, a bottle of water or whatever. So those are the kind of things you need to think of. And it's easier to think of them. Well, maybe it's not easier, but it's, it's certainly better to get good results if you think of them while it's happening instead of waiting until you edit because I couldn't really edit this. Like, you know, I guess the only thing you can really do is find something like this where what's the cutoff? Is it, you know, at the, at the knees? Is it at the pockets? Is it, at, you know, at her fingers? I don't know. Um, but I know that it's not going to be good enough as if it was careful, right? It just looks, it looks off like the angle this way looks off. So more careful composition there. So this is good. I like how, um, she kind of arranged the frame and you have the light here and she got, you know, the, the, it's, it would be very easy to get impatient and maybe shoot when there wasn't any light on his face so that the only light was on like the side of his shirt and his hat. And then you don't know what you're looking at. So him looking this way into the light like this is important and it definitely makes this picture better than it would have been. Um, what I would say about this is just not close enough, right? You're shooting at, 142. And one thing that I was kind of talking about a lot is not shooting a 70 to 200 behind the scenes. Um, this is a problem for a lot of people who only go to a rodeo with one lens in a 70 to 200, which is more common than you would think, even in the PRCA. Uh, but I would just say if you're shooting a 70 to 200 for action and that's what you want to do, that's fine. I don't do that, but that's fine if that's what you want to do. 
what I would say is stick with the wide angles behind the scenes. This picture would have been much better if you put on that 16 to 35 and went up right next to him where these right here, like where these stirrups were and were laying down on the ground and kind of shooting up with them. There's way more that you could have done with the light if you were close to him, because then even those little adjustments change where the hotspots are in the background, right? I want to see a picture of this guy. I don't want to see a picture of the light bouncing off the back of this guy, right? And the sun, you know, kind of peeking through over here and then this, and then this, this is what I'm talking about by taking the things out. Like if you had started, instead of saying, okay, I want to take a picture of this guy uh, stretching out his saddle, you want to say, okay, this is something I might want to take a picture of what might be bad for this picture. And I would say, well, this is really cool. You know, the, the way that this light is reflected off of something else, but this light is direct. And then you have the shadows and you have this dark background here. Like, okay, we're starting to see where there could be a picture there. But then if you say, what's the problem? The problem is that there's sunlight bouncing off of things that we don't care about. This, if this was a consistent line of cowboys who were all standing along a fence, stretching out their saddles, pulling their bull ropes or whatever, that would be okay. But there's one guy here, two, and then there's this big gap here. Then there's this guy and this guy who don't appear to be even cowboys like getting ready. They just, they look like they're either, this looks like me actually. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but the the thing is that like, you want all of this to be the backs of people or like a crowd or something that's happening, not... I, these are like um, false alarms. Like, okay, bright. Oh, no, nothing really to see here. Bright, nothing to see here. Same here, all through here, right? You want the only bright things to be the things that you want to be looking at and you want to figure out how to get all this other stuff to be either not in the frame or in the shadows. So again, I'm saying if you're right here and you're shooting with a 16 to 35 and you're laying on the ground, he's 90% of your frame. There might be a tiny little bit of the sky over here, but you might be able to compose away. You could maybe move over here to where his feet are and shoot up this way. And then you just have this, um, this dark area of the shoots. There's a lot of different things, but when you're shooting with a 70 to 200 and you're at 142, there's just really not that much you can do because moving, you know, even a couple feet one way or the other isn't really going to take very much out. It's certainly not going to take this guy out, right? That's always going to be there if you're shooting in this direction with that length of a lens, there's no way you can compose around that. But if you put the wide angle lens on and get really close, then all of those little adjustments result in big changes to the composition. And then the more looks you can see, the more quickly you can weed out the ones that don't work from the ones that do work. So I would just, you know, look at this picture, but then look at the dead space that you have, like all of this, all of this, right? If it was just a field, if it was just a blue sky and grass, it would be fine. But it's not. So you have to figure out a way to either get rid of this or make it more interesting. I don't see how to make it more interesting if, unless there were 20 more guys standing back here. So to me, that means just kind of focus in on what the subject is and make sure you have that taken care of completely. So everybody wants to shoot in light like this. Um, we're very lucky at Gilroy that they have two of the performances that, that run into sunset like this. Um, I think that this is another problem that is chalked up to shooting things that are more um, predictable than than rodeo, right? So I would know that uh, this girl is roping and eventually she's going to come back towards, um, you know, towards this corner, right? She's coming around and she's coming back this way. So I'm looking at these tents, which I don't like that they have them and I don't want them in the backgrounds of my pictures, and these poles right here, the same. So knowing that she's going to come back around and pass through the sun, I'm going to wait a little bit, let her come to me. If you don't shoot rodeo all the time, you might not know that. You, it might not be, you might know, but it might not be on the top of your mind. You might be having to keep a million other things like what shutter speed you're at and what ISO to be at or whatever on, on the top of your head. So it's understandable that you you know, you weren't paying attention at the timing, but that is a factor. The way this is set up right now with this background distracting from her 
And then really the only cool thing about this picture is the way the light is coming and then her hand on the mane of the horse. But you have to do a lot of work to get all the way over there. And, I, you know, I, I don't think that cropping is going to help because there's no way that you can get her and the horse in there and crop out all of this because the tents are at head level and the poles are, you know, at, at this at this depth. So, um, I don't know, you know, we're talking about what's the most we could get out of it is something like this. And I'm not crazy about where we'd be cutting that off. So what I would have liked to have seen again is some, you know, waiting until she comes back and then using her riding through the sun to see if that composition would have given you something. This is better. This is the best that you'll be able to get in this situation. And, you know, mostly I've taken out the poles because um, you can barely see this one, but you still have these tents and, this is just something that I would want to be a lot closer to or have a better angle on with a much, much longer lens. So, um, you know, this one, I, I just think you just didn't understand what the timing was going to be like here and maybe jump the gun a little bit. So during the team roping, we were kind of, uh, I don't know if all of us were, but a bunch of us were shooting from this general area. So it was low, um, on the healer side and, um, the kind of what I was explaining was that you can see the top of the fence right here. This isn't ground level, right? Ground level is somewhere down here. So you have this length of or the, the height of the fence here, and then you have people standing around and standing on top of the fence. And anything that was happening here, like right when they came out of the box, was just going to be completely, uh, you could not get a silhouette out of them because the silhouette line is here and they are below it. So you just wouldn't have been able to, to really do that. So we were having to wait, you know, quite a while for them to come out because the further out they came, the closer they were getting to us and the higher they were getting relative to the horizon line. So you can see it on this picture where if they had been back here, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have been able to see the Cowboys underneath this line. But in this one, um, you know, when you get out this far, then you're closer. So the relative size of, you know, the cowboy and the horse is bigger than what the background is and, and sticks over. So let's look at both of these pictures. Like this is a cool, like landscape establishing kind of shot ruined a little bit by these lights. I ruined maybe a little bit strong because it's still kind of a, a cool picture with all of these guys with their hats and then the Gilroy rodeo sign. I don't know. I maybe would have tried, tried to cut it off. I always look for like, what is the, what's the smallest picture that I can get or what's the biggest picture I can get eliminating all the stuff that bothers me. And then you would have something like this. And, you know, I would just rather have this, honestly. Um, I, I don't know what, having the uncropped picture really helps, you know, you're, you're bringing in again, tents and this light pole and, uh, the power pole, and then all of this dark area here. And this is just so much of a cleaner picture. So I would definitely go with this. If you're, you're already not going to have the, the, the Cowboys who are competing in it, then you may as well have the prettiest picture that you can have. And I would say that's probably it. So I think that this, I think this is another good example of timing because w when I was doing this, I was trying to use uh, the edge. So I was setting up right here. I knew I wasn't going to take a picture going back this way. I knew that the edge of my frame was going to be on this G because I wanted to get Gilroy and Rodeo. I wanted those to both be visible, um, but I wanted to give them as much chance as they could to get into this area here, right? The area bounded by this edge of the light, the horizon of the silhouette, and then uh, where the sun is. So that is, that's the area where, like you can see, you get a silhouette out of the horse and the rider. The, pro the only problem here is that she waited a little bit too long because the steer's head is now underneath this light. I would have liked to have seen that just a little bit back you know, if she had taken this picture a little bit earlier, then we could have had a crop that looked something like, um, 
you know, if the if the steer's head was here, then we're looking at this. But the problem is that to get rid of the lights, you have to get rid of the steer's head. And it would just be so much better if you didn't have to do that. And that's a lot of times the difference between a good picture and a bad picture. So if we're extending this out to get the front of the steer, then you're bringing in this and you don't want to do that. So that's, that's kind of, um, I don't know, it, it becomes a math problem at some point where you have um, the, the angle of view through your lens and then you have the time that it takes from them when they start to get to the opening where you can begin to get a silhouette and then, you know, two swings of the rope and they're to the light. So this is the kind of thing where you really have to know you, this, this isn't a situation where you're, you know, kind of, um, following the action along through the camera. This is where you are, uh, pre-composing, you know, like this is where they're going to be. This is the edge of the frame and I'm going to push the button when they start to get into that area. Um, you really have to do that because you don't want something this small to ruin your picture. And I know, you know, I know what that's like. I had a picture ruined by a errant Gatorade bottle at Gilroy. So, you know, sometimes you just have to let it go because what are you going to do? Your choice here is either to cut off the steer's head or, um, include the lights. And neither one of those is really one that I want to deal with. This is more of a picture that I would have expected from Elizabeth. I think it's very nice. Um, the careful composition of the sun peeking through like that and then the different colors of the sky and then the rodeo. The only thing I would say is, um, you know, you have to be careful when you're shooting at something like F25. So these settings, I would say, are kind of not where you would want to be for something like this. Um, you know, F25 is really difficult to shoot at and... There's no good, not really any good reason to be at 1 500th and 640. So if you're trying to let as little light in as possible, go down to, you know, ISO 100, drop this way down and drop this down, um, you know, you'll be much better off. And then this, you know, what you're dealing with here is F25 and you're dealing with diffraction. You can see that, um, you know, the rope isn't crisp here. It's not crisp here. That's what I would want to see. Um, so I like the composition, but the, the execution is a little bit off because, again, there's not really any good reason for the for this to be out of focus and, you know, kind of mushy like this. It should be um, if you had uh, opened this up a little bit and maybe focused on, you know, if you put this on like, I don't know, F11 or F8 or something like that and focused on the rope, then you would have gotten everything in focus and it would have been much better as a picture. Um yeah. And, you know, part of this is this isn't a picture that you should be taking with a 70 to 200. This is a picture you should be taking with a wide angle just for the um, I don't know, the the depth that it would convey like this. The the long lens is kind of flattening everything. It makes it look like the rodeo sign is right behind here. If I was taking this picture, it would be with a 24 and I would want to show how much space was in between these two things, because I think that would look cooler that's a choice, you know, certainly Elizabeth knows, you know, what she wants to do better, but, um, that's what I'm, that, what I would do is I wouldn't try to shoot this with a long lens. I would want to shoot with a wide lens. Um, but either way you have to get the, the rope in focus it has to be sharp, even though it's in a silhouette. So I think this is a cool picture. Um, I like the fact that the, the pickup man's head is, uh, right over top of the bull, but I wouldn't have cropped it like this. This one screams vertical to me. Um, so, you know, every single time I'm going like this because I just, you know, not that much going on here. It's not wide enough to be like a wide angle kind of picture. If, if they were way further out in the arena, uh, maybe, but as far as I'm concerned, that's where this picture is. This is much more interesting, you know, just the, the fact that he's roping it and kind of getting ready to pull it away from the fence. The fact that the bull is definitely moving, looking right at you, coming right towards you uh, with the mountain in the background. Like, this is a nice picture. I like the depth of field difference between the bull and the the uh, the, uh, the roper. So, yeah, this is a good picture. I don't have any problems with that at all. This is not a very good action picture. Um, first of all, it's not in focus. Um, 
I, it's difficult. This she was shooting with a seventy to two hundred, and this was very far away. There's a limit to how far away you can shoot, and when you start shooting at infinity and it's very far away and then you're cropping it's going to look soft and that's what's going on here so all of this is soft and then beyond that in in rodeo what you want to see is um you know this part is good the horse being in the air is good and the spurring is good and the rain but you want to see the horse more of an at an angle like this kicking up in the air or over its head so even if this had been in focus and not too far away it still would have been just kind of a you know the horse isn't doing exactly what it really should be doing. It's the background is not distracting. That's fine, but it's not enough to make up for the lack of good action. This is better. Um, you know, I, I wish you had had more chances, I think, to do this because this is the kind of thing where um, it takes a lot of practice. And then again, it's not just regular panning, like you're panning auto racing where everything is very consistent you're panning left to right, but then the horse is also going up and down every time it hits on one of its feet hoofs. Um, so it's very difficult to do that. I like the look of this. I like how it's backlit and you're shooting kind of through this dust. All that is cool. Um, I would rather have had a much slower shutter speed. So for panning, I don't really consider 150th to be panning, even for like auto sports where they're moving hundreds of miles an hour. I still don't shoot at 150th. Panning for human powered sports is like 115th or 110th or something like that. Um, I would want to be down down there. So the, the point of panning is you want to be moving the camera as much as possible to blur out what's going on in the background. And you're not doing that here. Like you can still see individual forms of people. And the whole point of panning is to have different degrees of complete mush in the background while still having um, the subject crisp. And that's harder, obviously, the lower you go, but that's why you have to do it a lot because, first of all, you'll get better the more you practice, and second of all, just probabilities. You'll, you know, the longer you do it, the more you'll make it, and you can just throw away the ones that you didn't make it. So um, this would be something that I would say to try again. You want to make sure that maybe wait a little bit for him to get a little bit closer to you, a little bit further down the arena so that it's taking up more of the frame. I don't really, you know, these are, these are all really loose and I don't know if that's kind of like a personal choice, but I don't need to see the back of the calf here. If, you know, if, if it was really close and that was the edge of the frame, then that's fine. But you have all this room that you can crop it. And I don't, none of this stuff is visually pleasing enough to leave in the picture. So I would say just go with this, right? It's not slow enough. Again, you can still see like the individual bars and the individual people, but this is closer to um, like a better composition than the other one. Again, just too much dead space that's not helping the picture. I'm not saying that everything has to be tight. I'm just saying that if you're going to be wide, then be wide. Sell out, go with the widest lens you have, and then let it actually be a wide picture. This isn't a wide picture right shooting at 70 when you're this close to something that's not why that's you know that's getting ready to be telephoto at that point so um yeah just shoot with a wider lens wait till it gets a little bit closer and then really do the really do the panning at that point so one i don't know you could start out at a 20th or something but i would say 15th or 10th of a second is where you want to be for something like this really get the blur and really try to match the speed and the the direction and all of that and like i said practice practice you'll get it eventually so uh these are the two uh wild horse race pictures that i think these are the two and yeah so this one i think is a really cool anticipatory kind of picture i think a little bit unlucky with this big sign right here you don't see that at a whole lot of places and that's kind of distracting for this but um i don't know I guess really from where she was, she couldn't even have seen that that was going to happen. I like the the way these guys are standing and I like the way the, the rain is up in the air like this and then the horse is breaking out. It's like I said, it's just a little bit unlucky that this is here. Maybe it would have been better if the the gate had swung open the other way and you saw more of the horse, but I'm ready to I'm ready to let this one go. I think it's fine. And then this one I really like. Like this obviously blew up kind of right in front of her. We're at 
um, 35 millimeters here. It's probably cropped in a little bit, but it's good action. You know, the uh, you can kind of see other stuff going on behind, which is cool because it's not distracting, but it gives you context. Um, and then these three guys are really having hell with this horse, and this guy looks like he's given up already. Um, so yeah, I mean these these wild horse racing pictures are the best of the action pictures, I would say. And then this one could be better if you if you worked on it a little bit. Um, as far as rough stock goes, definitely uh, practice getting the timing, knowing when the horse is going to kick, knowing if the horse is not. You know, some of them didn't kick very much at all. So sometimes you just have to deal with that. Um, especially at lower levels of rodeo, but we don't know about that one. I think this is really good. So let's look at the ones. Um, yeah, this, this, and these two. Um, you know, again, it, it's not. Uh, it's only a fraction of the ones that she sent me. I'm, I'm sure it's a smaller fraction of the ones that she actually took. But for somebody who doesn't shoot action very much, getting four good action pictures out of this. And then this one, which is just a pretty picture to have. I think that that's you know, a pretty good take for, for one day. Um, yeah, I, I should have mentioned that before. Elizabeth was only there for one day. Um, again, she's not trying to do this you know, permanently or primarily because she shoots lifestyle kind of stuff. So for one day and really for me just being able to coach her, you know, in between runs and in between events, I think this was pretty good. She didn't really have the benefit of shooting and then having a critique and then, you know, doing it multiple times. So I think that, um, these two were both, I think probably towards the end of how she was shooting. So, you know, I, I take, um, uh, you know, I would be proud if I was her that, you know, after a long day of shooting, you pulled it together uh, to make these two pictures. So, um, that's good. And then, yeah, this one as well, I guess towards the end, that's, um, that's a pretty picture. So yeah, it's good stuff to grow. And I think that, um, you know, if you want to do this, if you want to get better at this, it's probably not going to be something that you can do casually. I think that the difference between what you shoot, uh, people standing and, um, posing and things like that, uh, probably doesn't give you know it, you can train your eye for sure but it definitely doesn't train you for the spatial component of it how things move in relation to themselves and to other things and then just the sheer speed and power of everything um, if you want to get better at that I, I would say um, definitely make plans to to get to a few more rodeos and and definitely practice uh, matching their speed and getting used to it because that will allow the the eye that you develop in your other work to kind of come back and, and help you in rodeo. So that's all for today. Again, these were Elizabeth Hayes pictures from the Matt Cohen photo workshops in Gilroy, California in August of 2019. If you would like more information, you can go to mattcohenphoto.com slash workshops. Thanks for your time.